and I'm back from another break. So here we go, folks. In that situation, when I've been triggered and I've gone into this other place, there's a protective mechanism that kicks in, and it kicked in when I was a child. So while I was actually being raped or tortured, the levels of pain were so extreme and indescribable and unspeakable that I went somewhere else. And I went to the upper world. So as a shaman, I know that. I had no idea until I had actually completed my training as a shaman and done a load of drawings of the upper world. And then finally it hit me one day. At that point, my house was full of drawings that I'd made. And I saw these drawings of the upper world. And I just looked at this drawing one day and I thought, that's where I went when I was being raped and tortured and violated. Yeah, cool. So, the thing about going into this other place, there's a real downside. And the downside is I can't be reached, and I can't reach out, and I experience a level of loneliness, which is horrific. And that's why Teal in that film talks about, well, you could have, say, a natural disaster, like an earthquake, or a hurricane, or a bomb dropped or whatever, and all the survivors pick themselves up and they're going through hell, there's no doubt about it, and you think, that's the worst thing in the world. Or you think about people starving, and you say to yourself, that's the worst thing in the world, but it isn't. Sorry, it isn't. And why do I say that? Because if that's the situation, then everyone is suffering together. No matter how horrific it is, at least you know that you are not on your own. However, when I get triggered and I go to the other place, I am on my own and I can't reach out to anyone. So this was described by someone very recently, is imagine that Keith is in the same room as everybody else and suddenly this glass partition falls down and cuts him off from everyone in the room. Now this is what I used to experience all my life every time I went to a party. So every single time I ever went to a life, a party, every time I went to a life in a party, now every time I went to a party in my life, what would happen is, because I would actually be triggered by being in a party situation, this glass wall would come down and I'd be cut off from everyone else and no one would be able to sense what pain I was in. No one would have a clue. They would just see me sitting there like a normal human being. And I couldn't tell them because I'll tell you what, I once went to a party shortly after my wife died of cancer and this woman said to me, hello, what's been going on? I said, my wife died of cancer and I realised at that moment you can't say things like that at a party because people can't cope. So then I had to actually not be helped by her because my wife just died of cancer, I had to help her get over the fact that she's having difficulty in processing the fact that can you see how hilarious this all is? It's all very funny, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm having to cancel the person because he's having to deal with the fact that I was just told that my wife's had cancer. So that's been my experience of going to parties and so on. In fact, going into enclosed spaces of music is very challenging for me. Going to festivals is totally cool. The glass partition doesn't happen there, so that's totally fine. So when this happens to the person, when they're behind the glass partition, when they're in this other place, they can't reach out. So there's all sorts of consequences, and now one of the really obvious consequences, if you're in a relationship with someone, you're intimate with someone, and they suddenly go into this other place, that's pretty disturbing, because, hey, I love you, you've gone, I can't reach you anymore. Can you imagine how awful that could be? It's really horrible, isn't it? Just think about it for a moment, that's really tough. So if for anyone in a relationship with someone who's been through the constellation of things like myself, any kind of really serious trauma is going to do it, like PTSD, rape, torture, violence, whatever, that's all going to do it. You're going to have to be facing the fact that at certain points in your existence, your partner is going to be completely inaccessible to you. And that could be very disturbing. And it's like you won't be able to reach them and they won't be able to reach you so long as they're being triggered. Now my suggestion to you, if you're in a relationship with someone who's experienced these constellations of abuse, the best thing you can do is be patient, because if the threat stops being broadcast, whatever that threat might happen to be, basically they will calm down, and as they calm down, then they'll be able to find their way out of that prison that they just found themselves in, that they couldn't get out of for that period of time. So that's a really practical and helpful thing. I'm going to take another break now.
So, back after the break. Now, here's the thing. So, if someone reveals that they've experienced abuse of some kind, and it's so much in the news, isn't it? This morning I go to buy some food in Tesco for breakfast, and there I'm minding my own business, and there's the newspaper headlines, famous actress Liz Ant Anthony has come out and told everyone that she was raped by Harvey Weinstein, and it began in 1983, and she had a period of 20 years when, when this dude felt like it, he was just get in touch with her, go through some manipulative machinations and end up raping her. So one of the big questions people ask about this sort of thing is, why do people let people do this to them? It's a bit of an obvious question, isn't it? Well, what it is, is the people that do these things know how to manipulate. They know how to put the person into a state whereby they actually lose their sovereign free will. So that's something I want you to know. I want you to have more compassion than you ever had before in your life if you didn't know that and you were ignorant because you now know that anyone that ever got raped ever, what happened is something happened to violate their free will and once that happened to that person, they then became what I would call an easy target. So because he raped her once in the hallway in 1982, 83, whenever it was, then when he felt like he had come to the UK, and he could manipulate another one of those interactions at will, which went on for 20 years. Right, so here's another thing. If you're really smart and perceptive, you'll have noticed something about the way I'm being in this film. I'm talking about pretty horrific things, and I'm doing so very much staying in my head. I'm up here. I'm not down there at all. I'm not in my heart, I'm in my head. If I'm in my head, I can communicate about this stuff. If I was to go right now into my heart in this film, I would be experiencing unspeakable, unimaginable pain. That would mean that I would not be able to say any words. And I've just been through some days of not being able to speak, so take all this in, dudes, right? So here's a question that's been asked of me, and the question is as follows. Keith, why don't you let go of the past, the abuse, the torture, and live here, now, in the present, with me? It's a perfectly fair question when you think about it, isn't it? So I'm going to answer that question. So here's the thing. Yesterday I watched a film, and it's a East Asian film, China, Korea, somewhere like that, and this dude is carrying a big wooden box and he's running and people are chasing him, and at a certain point he ends up on this bridge, and he's really obviously frightened he's going to die, but obviously he's keeping this box as well. So he ends up climbing over the bridge, holding the box, and then dropping, and he ends up, so he's holding the railing of the bridge with one hand, the box with the other hand. At that point the film moves on, so we don't ever know what happens to him, but you can see the choice he's got. Either he can let go of this thing he's holding on to and save his life by using his other hand and hopefully pull himself up out the bridge, or he's going to let go of the bridge and he's going to fall to his death. Now I'm introducing that to you because that's how I found out how to describe what goes on for me when I am triggered and I go into the nightmare of hell situation of the unspeakable, unimaginable pain. But let me give you a bit more detail about this because this is how it used to be for me and it still can be for me. So for example, I would sometimes create a retreat for myself and when I went into the state of being in a retreat for myself, what would happen is I would go into, you guessed it, you already knew it, yeah that's right, unspeakable, indescribable pain. And that would last for as long as that retreat went on. The other thing that would do it for meditation. Now, the first time I meditated in my life, I was 19, and I had a fantastic experience, which I'm not going to talk about. Instead, I'm going to talk about every other time I went into doing meditation, which is I would go into unspeakable, indescribable pain. And I used to think to myself, dude, what's up here? How come every time I try to meditate, all I experience is pain? That's a bit odd. And I used to listen to other people uh, about their meditation experiences. It didn't happen to anyone else. Well, obviously, I never asked people who'd been through the stuff that I'd been through. And if I had asked them, they would have said one of two things. 
they would either have said, well, I don't do that, or, yeah, I tried that, and I got the unspeakable and unmanageable pain. So that's the deal. And you'll notice what I'm speaking about. I'm really in my head. I'm using the words quite lightly, and I'm starting to speak a bit faster. Unspeakable and unmanageable pain, and I'm saying it so fast you can't even quite get the word. This is all the ways that I use to protect myself from actually fully embodying it and feeling it. So let's get back to that question again. And I don't apologize for any digression. This is so cool to be able to speak after days of not being able to do so. So the question was, why don't you let go of the past, the abuse, the torture, in living the now with me? So when I get triggered, someone gets angry being my primary trigger. If someone was to attempt to have sex with me, you can imagine that's going to create the same thing, isn't it, of course? Because if you've ever been raped, that's what you had, right? So when these things happen, I go into this place, now it's not the same as the man in the film. The man in the film is holding a box and he's holding onto the bridge with one hand. That's not me. I'll tell you where I go. Where I go is this. I'm holding on with the fingers and the thumbs of my hands and I'm holding on to the top of a cliff. And beneath me there's an unimaginable drop because it's dark. I can't see how deep the drop is actually. I haven't a clue. And I'm holding on. Only the thing is, somebody has driven a nail through every single one of my eight fingers and both of my two thumbs. That's actually what it feels like. So what I've done is I've just managed to find for you a visual metaphor which you can imagine with your own imagination. That's what Keith feels like when he gets triggered. So if you know me, and you ever saw me getting triggered, now you understand. That's actually how it feels. Because it's... You can imagine how horrific that is, because I'm in agonizing pain, and I can't let go. So the reason why this has come up so big time for me is during this healing process, I was given some particular advice. I'm going to read a little bit about some of the advice I got. So... During this process, this is what happened. I said, because of my first sexual approach resulting in rape, when my partner approaches me sexually, I go back to that place at 10 years old. So the third party in this healing space wrote the following words down, because remember, I can't speak at this point, just a few days ago, so that they were very gently and respectfully entering my space, because I couldn't speak, but it's all through writing. And this is what I got as a reply. Well, it's time to let go of that. It doesn't matter what happened to you, but it does matter what happens through you. It's time to walk your talk. Taking action is what makes a difference. That's like saying to a depressed person, snap out of it. Not very helpful, is it, really? In fact, actually, it's incredibly disrespectful because when that person said those words to me, what they were implying was that I'm so ignorant that I need them to tell me that I need to snap out of that. Now, of course, the whole point is when you've been through really severe trauma and you get triggered, you get propelled into this other place, as I like to call it, and then you're trapped. Then I'm trapped. So that person saying to me, get out of it or take action. They're only saying that because they didn't understand what it feels like to be holding on to a cliff face with nails through your fingers and thumbs. Now here's the little bit I want to add to all this. Because it's dark, I can't see what's beneath me. And I think there's a beautifully bitter irony here. Because for all I know, Rather than hundreds and hundreds of feet between my feet and oblivion, there might only be six feet. There might actually only be six inches. Or, maybe it's paradise. But I can't find out or ascertain any of that information because I'm too terrified and it's dark and my hands are up there. So, the reason why I'm getting into such detail about this is what I want you to recognize is there's two kinds of people in the world. There's people who, when they listen to what I'm saying, know the territory. 
if you know the territory about what I'm talking about, you are going to completely get it, and you will most likely have a quality which is empathy. If what I'm talking about is very strange and mysterious, and you really think, what is this guy on about? Then that's because you won't have developed the empathy that you get from living these experiences. And lucky you, you may have experienced all sorts of traumas in your life, but at least you didn't get to experience this level of trauma. So I'm going to do a little virtual break now. So that's a virtual break. That's a virtual break over, so we're going to continue without interruption. So, here we go. I know some people in my life who really judge me harshly because I like to work with some plants. Now, here's the thing. I'm very, very grateful for the plants in my life because they help me extraordinarily. And actually, I know there have been times that it's the plants that make the difference between me being here and me not being here, because it means if things get completely unendurable, either there's a possibility I can have an experience with a plant that I like, or I can know that at some point in the future that will be possible, even if I have to wait some days or weeks. It will happen at some point, and just knowing that I will have that release and relief, that is so cool. For some people, heroin is the answer, or crack cocaine, because they're in so much pain, so much of the time, that actually it's not like me, because I'm relatively lucky, because I just get triggered now and then. Actually, of late, it's been pretty much every day, but some of the time it's now and then. But imagine how awful it would be to be triggered constantly. Then that's when people need something stronger, like heroin, crack cocaine. That's why it's so popular. And what do we do with people who've been taking these things? That's right, we punish them. We may even incarcerate them in a place. We may even lock them up in solitary confinement, which means that they're then experiencing this nightmare of hell even more excessively, because then rather than being triggered and being behind this glass wall like what happens to me on a regular basis, they've gone bye-bye, there's metal walls. There's metal bars. Can you imagine what that's like? What a way to treat someone who is in so much pain. Yeah? And I'm going to give this example. And you'll have seen this in your life. And you will have been both sides of this. There will be times you'll... I don't know why, but a really good place to witness this is a railway station. If you're in a railway station or a bus station, you'll see someone in great distress. Possibly crying and you will feel this impulse that you want to help them and you don't know how to help them and you like this, do I help, don't I help, do I help, don't I help and then you walk on I reckon pretty much everyone will have experienced this at some point in their lives it might be a different venue, different location, but you see what you're getting at so there are times when someone is in this other place then it's hell, but they're actually able to express it by maybe crying or wailing or making some kind of a sound and everyone just walks past and ignores them. So all of us pretty much will have experienced of walking past and ignoring them and many of us will have experienced a place of being actually in that state of extreme distress and crying or whatever and no one comes to answer. And then I go whoop! It's my first year of life, and my first year of life is very unusual. Because my father has got tuberculosis, he's got about six months to live. My mother is looking after him, and they've got a baby, and that's me. And he needs a lot of looking after, because she doesn't know if he's going to make it. So what happens is that she does the best she can for me, bless her. And um, Because it's a long time ago, and in those days it was a fashionable thing to do. When you have babies, what you do is you put them in a pram outside, and leave them to it, and you bring them in and feed them and change the nappies, but basically they spend time outside, doesn't matter what time of year it is, it's good for them, out in the nature. 
sound, isn't it? There's nothing wrong with that. So that means in the first year of my life, I had a lot of experience of being in a situation where I needed to be touched, I needed to be seen, I needed to be recognised, I needed to be held. And what I did, you, well, what everyone does, I was the same as that person on that railway station platform. I cried. I was a baby, I cried because I wanted my mummy. And I cried and I cried and I cried. And eventually I got so tired of crying I stopped. And so I learned a very valuable lesson at that point in my life. If I cry for help, no one comes. Because you have to remember that when you're a baby, time is not the same as when you're a child or an adult or a person of advanced years. What happens is when you're a baby, time is almost endless. So a whole day takes like an infinity of time. So if a baby is in the pram and crying for half an hour, that's a gazillion hours as far as that baby is concerned. If that person was 45 and he cried for half an hour, it would probably feel like 20 minutes. You know what I'm saying? So this is how it worked. So that meant I had this fundamental experience of when you go, when you cry for help, no one will heed you. So I had that down pat, so I was a very good target for the people that chose to do all the things they did with me, you see. So here's my situation. I need to take another break. This is actually quite disturbing. Thank you.